This is Twit. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We're playing your song, Rod, but we can't... <laughs> <laughs> we can't get uh, get you up on uh, on the internet. That sometimes happens. I'm really excited to have Rod Pyle uh, join us uh, on the show to talk about space. We I realized after we uh, talked about the last uh, launch, uh, the SpaceX launch with the Crew Dragon, people we watched the rocket go up. People were very interested in that, and uh, I thought it'd be fun to have somebody to talk about what's going on these days in uh, in space. And Rod Pyle, he's not exactly a spaceman, but uh, he covers a space. He writes about space. He's the author of Space 2.0. He's also the editor-in-chief of Ad Astra. And now we have, we have him coming in from a galaxy far, far away, Rod Pyle. Hi, Rod. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. How are you? Oh, it's great to me. <laughs> live long and prosper. It's, <laughs> it's giving me the Vulcan salute. I love that. Well, it's great to talk to you. Tell me a little bit about your interest in space. When did that start? Well, I was born just a little bit before you, so kind of when NASA was starting up about a year before. And um, so we grew up at the same time. I don't know when you started getting interested, but I started getting interested about the, the middle of the Gemini program. It was hard not to get excited when Walter Cronkite would well, sit there waiting as the astronauts were about to launch. It, that's very good. And, <laughs> and Cronkite was the guy. You yeah, know, he if was. For some reason, you couldn't get CBS, you felt right? So then <laughs> Apollo came along. And we had this these incredible series of flights going off to oh, do amazing. remarkable exploration of the moon as often as every 10 weeks. Our as generation as to today. got to experience this, and it was so exciting. Uh, and then, of course, we had the Challenger disaster and the space shuttle, and it just kind of dwindled out. And then NASA, it almost felt like went out of business about, I don't know, 10 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> but we're back, baby. Oh. Yeah. And actually, if you look at the public polls, a lot of people, you know, have thought that NASA closed down or the space station crashed because they got it mixed up with Skylab or something like that. But with this new space age that we're in, and it truly is, I mean, up till I give a lot of talks to young people and up till a few years ago, I'd keep saying, you know, just hold on, study engineering, study science, study math, because the space age is going to be back really soon. And then SpaceX launched the Falcon Heavy, Elon Musk's biggest hobby and it was just a magnificent moment as it was this return to space flight and now we have the united states taking its own spacecraft back to the space station for the first time the since first time. 2011 isn't that exciting we used to have to use the russians of all people we used to have to use the russians to get to the space station um it's nice that we can do our own launches and i don't know about you but the moment for me when i realized space is back was that amazing f or I think it was one of the first Falcon Heavy launches where the boosters came back to Earth, twinned, landing on that platform in the middle of the seat together as if it was a ballet. At that point, I got such chills and I said, it's back. The thing that's yeah. different, that's really interesting about space these days, and I, you know, Jerry Purnell, the science fiction author, is a great friend of mine. He was always a big proponent of commercial space exploration. I said, Jerry, that's never going to happen. It has to be government. Business has got different interests. They're not going to want to spend the billions of dollars on this kind of blue sky, literally blue sky research. He said, no, Leo, you're wrong. And he was right. Because it's, but it's, but it's interesting. It's the, it's the marriage of commercial and government that is really putting us back in space. Yeah, and in a whole new way, because as you probably recall, back in the day when NASA, NASA never built much of it, many of its own spacecraft. JPL does, which is where I used to work. But um, NASA, you know, when they built the Apollo capsules and they built the shuttle, that was all by contractors. But these were military style cost plus contracts. You tell us it's going to cost $2 billion, it ends up costing $4 billion, we paid the difference, and you still get your markup. Now these are fixed fee contracts. So if SpaceX or Blue Origin or Boeing gets a set amount of money for one of these spacecraft or a rocket, they have to deliver or come up with a really compelling reason why they didn't. And by NASA's own estimates, which is fascinating, SpaceX's Falcon 9 and the Crew Dragon have cost between one half and one tenth of what they would have doing it the old way, wow. which is a great bargain for us taxpayers, yeah. right? And by the way, they're working pretty well. Um, 
the Japanese astronaut uh, Soichi Noguchi said it was the best yeah. ride he's ever <laughs> he's ever had. He said yeah. it's the best space. I don't know how many spacecraft he's flown, but he said it's the best, better than the shuttle, better than Soyuz. Uh, he's flown on both of those. He loved the Crew Dragon. So not only are we saving money, yeah. Uh, apparently, it's even better. Uh, what about safety, yeah. though? Do, 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 do these? I worry that if there's commercial pressure to make money, that there might be corners cut. There are, but you know, if you go to the SpaceX plant in Hawthorne, I've been there a few times. You know, you see it. It, it you know, when you went to a NASA plant in the old days, you'd see one rocket stage or one spacecraft being worked on. They were integrating or whatever, and it's all these clean room conditions. SpaceX looks like the GM of rockets. There's you know, 10 interstages off the left with people working away on them. And there's five rocket engine assemblies over there and the capsules are in a clean room. But it really is this doing it by volume so that they've learned where they can cut corners without endangering the crews or endangering right. the spacecraft. And let's remember about that Russian spacecraft, by the way, that was the competitor to the American Apollo spacecraft Soyuz. that was designed yeah. in about 1965. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, the Soyuz. That sounded familiar. <laughs> so it's kind of old, you know. And they yeah. were they started off by charging us about $34 million a seat after we retired the shuttle in 2011. By the time we bought the last set of tickets, it was closer to almost $90 million. So SpaceX looks like a better and better deal, and pretty soon Boeing Starliner will fly. So we'll have two ways of getting up there, which is just great. So I'm, I, I hope we can do this on a regular basis, Rod, because I am very excited yeah. to see space back. Like you, we grew up watching this, and I always felt bad for my kids that they didn't have this. And I admit, it's a big expense. We have big issues at, on Earth, although relative to the problems on Earth, the billions we spend on spaceflight aren't that much. But it's so great for the human imagination and for the spirit to know that we're, you know, we're doing something really big, really interesting. What's ahead? I, I know Elon wants to go to Mars. Yeah. Is that actually in the forecast? Is that going to be something I might see in my lifetime, our lifetime? Well, it's in his forecast. Yeah. Well, Elon's a little nutty, as we know. <laughs> yeah. He's got Elon time, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think so, you know, because he's working on it. NASA's working on it at a slower pace, but but they want to get there by 2032. So if he doesn't manage to bypass what NASA's trying to do, we should be there at least by the 2030s. The problem with Mars isn't the tech and it isn't the know-how. We, we could do that in four years if we put the money into it. And as you mentioned, the money we spend on space isn't that much. It's about $22 billion a year. You compare that to something like the F-35 program, which has been closer to half a trillion, and it looks like a real bargain, right? But I think... Um, I think, I think Mars is doable. What we have to overcome is the long-term effects of zero gravity on the body, which are, are It's a very long trip, isn't it? Powerful. Yeah, it's five yeah. months yeah. one way. And then we have to figure out how to deal with this radiation issue because there's a lot of radiation it's, from the sun. It's a toxic there's, environment, too. The it's bad. I yeah. mean, space, hey, as I say in Space 2.0, space hates people. It really does. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't want these squishy bags of water and meat out there, right? One of the things so we that have I'm, to figure I'm, out those things. I'm almost more ex excited. I mean, man exploration is very exciting, but there's also unmanned stuff we're doing. There's space telescopes. I'm really curious about asteroid retrieval and mining. There's mm. a lot of stuff we can do that's a little closer to home, maybe a little more useful. Can we, on a regular basis, get together on the show and, and talk about that, Rod? I'd really appreciate it. How about every day? Okay, well, uh, we can do once a week. How about that? I'm not here every day. <laughs> that works. Okay. Rod Pyle. The book is Space 2.0, also Amazing Stories of the Space Age. You've got a lot of stuff. Uh, is there a website that you want people to go to uh, to find out more? Yeah, it's pilebooks.com, P-Y-L-E books.com. That's me. And, uh, and you can see his presentation uh, from CES there, the videos there. Rod, it's a pleasure to meet you. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited as we again go into space. <laughs> Rod Pyle. The pleasure's all mine, longtime <laughs> fan. Thanks again. Thanks, Rod. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. The Apollo astronauts going out into space. Yeah, you and I grew up with the same exact experience. I remember getting up early morning to see the, uh, the uh, lun lunar landing and the first steps on the moon and all that stuff. It's vividly, it's burned into my consciousness. We and and my parents were kind enough to let me stay home for all the moonwalks, which oh. was great till about the middle of Apollo 14. And when the media realized there wasn't going to be another terrifying emergency like Apollo 13 was... 
They were ha- the astronauts were halfway up to Cone Crater, which was their target, and the networks cut away to I Love Lucy oh. reruns of Days of Our Lives, oh. and I thought, what is this country coming I to? I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. There's a guy on the moon, and you want to watch I Love Lucy?